Hello everyone. I uh, received a request to read from the book Flatland by Edwin A. Abbott. So I thought I would um, read the first chapter. And if you guys like that and want me to continue, I can do so. Let's see. Let's skip the introduction and go straight into, let's see, the first chapter. Part 1. This World. Chapter 1. Of the Nature of Flatland. I call our world Flatland, not because we call it so, but to make its nature clearer to you, my happy reader, who are privileged to live in space. Imagine a vast sheet of paper on which straight lines, triangles, squares, pentagons, hexagons, and other figures, instead of remaining fixed in their places, move freely about, on or in the surface, but without the power of rising above or sinking below it, very much like shadows, only hard, and with luminous edges. And you will then have a pretty correct notion of my country and my countrymen. Alas, a few years ago I should have said my universe but now my mind has been opened to higher view of things. In such a country you will perceive at once that it is impossible that there should be anything of what you call a solid kind. But I dare say you will suppose that we could at least distinguish by sight the triangles, squares, and other figures moving about as I have described them. On the contrary, we could see nothing of the kind, at least not so as to be distinguishing one figure from another. Nothing was visible, nor could be visible to us except straight lines, and the necessity of which I will speedily demonstrate. Place a penny in the middle of one of your tables in space, and leaning over it, look down upon it. It will appear as a circle. But now, drawing back to the edge of the table, gradually lower your eyes, thus bringing yourself more and more into the condition of an inhabitant of flatland, and you will find the penny becoming more and more oval to your view, and at last, when you have placed your eye exactly on the edge of the table, so that you are, as it were, actually a flatlander, the penny will have then ceased to appear oval at all, and will have become, so far as you can see, a straight line. The same thing would happen if you were to treat in the same way a triangle or square or any other figure cut out of pasteboard. As soon as you looked at it with your eye on the edge of the table, you will find that it ceases to appear to you as a figure and then it becomes an appearance of a straight line. Take, for example, the equilateral triangle, which represents with us a tradesman of a respectable class. Figure 1 represents the tradesman as you would see him while you were, you were bending over him from above. Figures 2 and 3 represent the tradesman as you would see him if your eye was closed to the level, or all but on the level of the table. And if your eye were quite on the level of the table, and that's how you would see him in flatland, you would see nothing but a straight line. When I was in Spaceland, I heard of your sailors have a very similar experience when they traverse your seas and discern some distant island or coast lying on the horizon. The far-off land may have bays, forelands, angles in and out, any number and extent, unless indeed your sun shines bright upon them, revealing the projections and retirements by means of light and shade but nothing but gray and broken line upon the water. Well, that is just as we see one another of our triangular or other acquaintances coming towards us in flatland. As there is neither sun with us, or any light such as the kind to make shadows, we have none of the helps to the sight that you have in spaceland. If our friend comes closer to us, we see his line become larger. If he leaves us, it becomes smaller, but still he looks like a straight line because he is triangle, square, pentagon, hexagon, circle, what you will, a straight line he looks and nothing else. You may perhaps ask, under these disadvantageous circumstances, we are able to distinguish our friends from one another. But the answer to this very natural question will be more fitly and easily given when I come to describe the inhabitants of Flatland. For the present, let me defer this subject and say a word or two about the climate and houses in our country. Of the Climate and Houses in Flatland 
As with you, so also with us, there are four points of the compass, north, south, east, and west. There being no sun or other heavenly body, it is impossible for us to determine the north in the usual way. But we have a method of our own. By a law of nature with us, there is a constant attraction to the south, and although in temperature climates this is very slight, so that even a woman in reasonable health can journey several furlongs northward without much difficulty, yet the hampering effect of the southward's attraction is quite sufficient to serve as a compass in most parts of our earth. Moreover, the rain, which falls at stated intervals, coming always from the north, is an additional assistance, and in the towns we have the guidance of our houses, which, of course, have their side walls running, for the most part, north to south, so that the roofs may keep off the rain from the north. In the country where there are no houses, the trunks of trees serve as a sort of guide. Altogether, we have not so much difficulty as you might expect in determining our bearings. Yet in our more temperate regions, in which the southward attraction is hardly felt, walking sometimes in a perfectly desolate plain, where there have been no houses nor trees to guide me, I have been occasionally compelled to remain stationary for hours together, waiting until the rain came before continuing my journey. On the weak and aged, and especially on delicate females, the force of attraction tells much more heavily on them than the robust males. So that is a point of breeding. If you meet a lady in the street, always give her the north side of the way, by no means an easy thing to do, always, at short notice, when you are in rude health, and in a climate where it is difficult for you to tell north from south. Windows there are none in our houses, for the light comes to us alike in our homes and out of them, by day and night, equally and at all times and in all places, whence we know not. It was in old days with our learned men an interesting and oft investigated question, what is the origin of light? And the solution had been repeatedly attempted, with no other result than to crowd our lunatic asylums with would-be solvers. Hence, after fruitless attempts to suppress such investigations indirectly by making them liable to a heavy tax, the legislature in comparatively recent times absolutely prohibited them. I, alas, alone in Flatland, know only too well the true solution of this mysterious problem. But my knowledge cannot be made intelligible to a single one of my countrymen, and I am mocked at. I, the sole possessor of the truth of space, and the theory of the introduction of light into the world of three dimensions, as it were, the madness of the mad, but a truce of these painful digressions, let me return to our houses. The most common form of our construction of a house is five-sided, or pentagonal, as in the annexed figure. The two northern sides, R-O and O-F, constitute the roof, and for the most part have no doors. On the east is a small door for the women, in the west a much larger one for the men. The south side, or floor, is usually doorless. Square and triangular houses are not allowed, and for this reason. The angle of a square, and still more those of an equilateral triangle, being much more pointed than those of a pentagon, and the lines of inanimate objects such as houses being dimmer than those of the lines of men and women, it follows that there is no little danger lest the point of a square or a triangle house resident might do serious injury to an inconsiderate or perhaps absent-minded traveler, suddenly, therefore, running against them. And as early as the eleventh century of our era, triangular houses were forbidden by law, the only exception being fortifications, powder magazines, barracks, and other state buildings, which it is not desirable that the general public should approach without circumspection. At this period, square houses are still everywhere permitted, though discouraged by a special tax. But, about three centuries afterwards, the law decided that, in all towns containing a population over 10,000, the angle of a pentagon was the smallest house angle that could be allowed, consistently with public safety. The good sense of the community has seconded the effort of the legislature, and now, even in the country, the pentagonal construction has superseded every other, and it is only now and then in some very remote backward agricultural district that an antiquarian still may discover a square house. Concerning the inhabitants of Flatland. The greatest length and breadth of a full-grown inhabitant of Flatland may be estimated to be about 11 of your inches. 12 inches may be regarded as a maximum. Our women are straight lines. Our soldiers and lower classes of workmen are triangles with two equal sides, each about 11 inches long, and a base, or third side, so short, often not exceeding half an inch, that they form at their vertices a very sharp and formidable angle. Indeed, when their bases are of the most degraded type, 
not more than an eighth part of an inch in size, they can hardly be distinguishable from straight lines or women, so extremely pointed are their vertices. With us, as with you, these triangles are distinguished from others by being called isosceles, and by this name I shall refer to them in the following pages. Our middle class consists of equilateral or equal-sided triangles. Our professional men and gentlemen are squares, to which class I myself belong, and five-sided figures or pentagons. Next above these comes the nobility, of which there are several degrees, beginning at six-sided figures or hexagons, and from thence rising in the number of their sides until they receive an honorable title of polygonal, or many-sided. Finally, when the number of sides becomes so numerous that the sides themselves so small that the figure cannot be distinguished from a circle, he is included in the circular or priestly order, and this is the highest class of all. It is a law of nature with us that a male child shall have one more side than his father, so that each generation shall rise, as a rule, one step in the scale of development and nobility. Thus the son of a square is a pentagon, and the son of a pentagon a hexagon, and so on. But this rule does not always apply to the tradesmen, and still less often to the soldiers, and to the workmen, who indeed can hardly be said to deserve the name of human figures, since they have not all their sides equal. With them, therefore, the law of nature does not hold, and the sons of an isosceles, a triangle with two equal sides, remains isosceles still. Nevertheless, all hope is not shut out, even from the isosceles, that his posterity may ultimately rise above his degraded condition, for after a long series of military successes or diligent, skillful labor, it is generally found that the more intelligent among the artisans and soldiers classes manifest a slightly increase in their third side or base, and a shrinkage of their other two sides. Intermarriages, arranged by the priests, between the sons and daughters of the more intellectual members of the lower class, generally result in an offspring approximating still more the type of an equal-sided triangle. Rarely, in proportion to the vast number of isosceles births, it is a genuine and certifiable equal-sided triangle produced from an isosceles parents. From such birth requires, as its antecedent, not only a series of carefully arranged intermarriages, but also a long, continued exercise of frugality and self-control on the part of the would-be ancestors of the coming equilateral, and a patient, systematic, and continuous development of the isosceles' intellect through many generations. The birth of a true equilateral triangle from isosceles parents is the subject of rejoicing in our country for many furlongs around. After a strict examination conducted by the Sanctuary and Social Board, the infant, if certified as regular, is with solemn ceremonial admitted into the class of equilaterals. He is then immediately taken from his proud yet sorrowing parents and adopted by some childless equilateral, who is bound by oath never to permit the child henceforth to enter his former home, or so much as look upon his relations again for fear lest the freshly developed organism may, by force of unconscious imitation, fall back again into his hereditary level. The occasional emergence of an equilateral from the ranks of his serf-born ancestors is welcomed, not only by the poor serfs themselves, as a gleam of light and hope shed upon the monotonous squalor of their existence, but also by the aristocracy at large, for all of the higher classes are well aware that these rare phenomena, while they do little or nothing to vulgarize their own privileges, serve as a more useful barrier against revolution from below. Had the acute-angled rabble been all, without exception, absolutely destitute of hope and ambition, they might have found leaders in some of their more seditious outbreaks, so able to render their superior numbers and strength too much even for the wisdom of the circles. But a wise ordinance of nature has decreed that, in proportion as the working class increases in intelligence, knowledge, and all virtue, so that same proportion their acute angles, which make them physically terrible, shall increase also in approximate to the comparatively harmless angle of the equilateral triangle. Thus, in the most brutal and formidable of the soldiers' class, creatures almost all on a level with women for their lack of intelligence, it is found that, as they wax in their mental ability necessary to employ their tremendous penetrating power to advantage, so do they wane in the power of the penetration itself. How admirable is this law of compensation, and how perfect a proof of the natural fitness and, if I may say so, the divine origins of the aristocratic constitution of the state of Flatland. By a judicious use of this law of nature, the polygons and the circles are almost always able to stifle sedition in its very cradle. Taking advantage of the irrepressible and boundless hopefulness of the human mind, art also comes to the aid of law and order. It is generally found possible, by a little artificial compression or expansion on the part of the state physicians, to make some of the more intelligent leaders of a rebellion perfectly regular, 
and to admit them at once into the privileged classes, a much larger number who are still below the standards, allured by the prospects of being ultimately ennobled, are induced to enter the state hospitals, where they are kept in honorable confinement for life. One or two alone, the more obstinate, foolish, and hopelessly irregular, are led to execution. Then the wretched rabble of the isosceles, plainness and leaderless, are either transfixed without resistance by some small body of their brethren, whom the chief circle keeps to pay for emergencies of this kind, or else more often, by means of jealousies and suspicions skillfully fomented among them by the circular party, they are stirred to mutual warfare, and perish by one another's angles. No less than one hundred and twenty rebellions are recorded in our annals. Besides minor outbreaks, numbered at two hundred and thirty-five, they have all ended thus. So, that was actually the first three chapters that I read. Um, let me know what you think. Um, and if you would like me to continue, I will move on to chapter four, Concerning the Women. Um, I think this book is also a satire. Um, it's actually making fun of the social classes that were around at that time. So I think a lot of what it says about women and the lower classes is said um, as a criticism of the upper classes. So um, even though it sounds a little harsh sometimes, I think it is to bring into um, light the differences in classes that were around. Okay? Let me know if you like this. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, and I will see you next time.